Um, there's quite some content here, so first of all, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Ask questions in English, French, or any other language. I'll try to understand. Um, yeah. So the 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 goal is to somehow show what mechanisms there are to achieve anonymity in cryptocurrencies and show a little bit of the techniques behind. So sometimes it will be a bit mathy, but uh, there's like points in the talk where you can wake up if, if I lost you on the way. And yeah, I think I'll, I'll do a, a break in the middle. Okay, so here's a, a short overview of the talk. So I'll um, just uh, state that Bitcoin is not anonymous. I guess it's a, a well-known fact, so I won't uh, talk very much about this. And um, I'll then talk about what has been done to try to make uh, Bitcoin itself anonymous. So I'll talk about uh, the first approach was mixing services and then some protocols like CoinJoin and a very recent one, uh, Tumblebit, that work within Bitcoin. And uh, then I'll talk about a, a protocol called CryptoNote, which is basically the, um, the theory behind Monero and uh, what it does to hide the sender and the recipient of a, of a payment. Then in the fourth part I talk about confidential transactions, where the goal is to hide the amount that is transacted and uh, how Mimblewimble uses this to achieve even more. And finally, I'll talk about zero cash, which is basically the, uh, the most anonymous thing that you can imagine. Okay, Bitcoin is not anonymous, it's pseudonymous. This, uh, users are not known by their names, but just by their addresses. But of course, all transactions are public and they will stay in the blockchain forever. So um, there's plenty of analysis that you can do. You can analyze the transaction graph, you can listen to the network where a transaction comes from and so on. And there's companies whose business model is exactly such uh, analysis like uh, Elliptic. Um, why do we want anonymity? So first, uh, I think the main reason is because users have a right to privacy and uh, revealing what you spend your money on can reveal a lot about your religious, sexual, political uh, attitudes. And moreover, for companies it's also important to, um, to hide their internals for, from competitors. There's another reason which is uh, fungibility which is basically the concept that in a currency every, all coins should be equal. So it shouldn't matter whether you have one euro coin or a different one. But that's not the case in Bitcoin. For example, if uh, some mining pools decide that they will not accept uh, transactions that have been used in some criminal activity and you end up with such a transaction and they won't uh, include it in the, in, in the blockchain, then that's bad for you, so you could be blacklisted. So we don't have fungibility in Bitcoin. If it was anonymous, then we would have fungibility. Okay, we're right in time for the second overview. Okay, so here's a different overview. So I'll talk about anonymity within Bitcoin, then things that are implemented in sidechains, like the Elements project. Um, new altcoins, new cryptocurrencies that, um, that exist, that are in place. And finally some new proposals like Mimblewemble. Okay, um, so Bitcoin is not anonymous. How can we make it more anonymous? The first approach was using mixing services, where, you, where there's a service and you send them your coins and you get different coins back and uh, you hope that, first of all, you get coins back, and second, that these coins are unrelated. So there's been plenty of thefts, um, and the drawbacks here are obvious. You have to trust the service. So the service could steal your coin, and even if it doesn't steal your coins, it knows uh, which coins went where. And even if you trust the service, there's another problem, which is that the, your anonymity depends on the others. If you send in your coins, and all the other coins that are sent in belong to the FBI, then the FBI knows which coins you received because it's the ones that they didn't get. So it really it depends on the others, it depends on how much volume is mixed, um, so there's plenty of uh, drawbacks. One um, proposal that works in Bitcoin is CoinJoin, which uh, avoids this 
the central service and uh, it uses the fact that a transaction can have many inputs and basically within a transaction there's no there's no um, assignments of which outputs go belong to, to which input. So for example Alice and Bob could just together um, create this transaction where every one of them puts in three bitcoins and out come uh, two times three bitcoins and then you cannot tell which one belongs to Alice and which one belongs to Bob. So what's good here is that no one can steal the coins because by because both of them have to sign the transaction and they would only sign a transaction if they uh, know it's, it's their address that's uh, where the output goes to. The problem is that the participants themselves, so if you do this with a lot of people, the people that participate in this coin join, they would still know um, which coins belong to who. And of course this is also prone to denial of service attack because people could just refuse to sign and then um, depending on what time lock you put, but you you might not be able to to get your coins back for a while. The nice thing is that it works with Bitcoin. Um, and a very recent proposal was uh, Tumblebit, where again we we use a central service, but now this central service need not be trusted at all. So you don't need to trust it for um, stealing your coins because it can't steal your coins. And also you don't need to trust it for anonymity. So I won't go into too much detail, but it's uh, basically if Alice wants to send the coin to, to some Bob, then there's uh, several transactions. There's an escrow transaction first and then a claim transaction. It's similar to what, what Lightning does. So it uses these multi-sig um, functionalities to do these things. And uh, the new thing is that um, these, uh, so the inputs and the outputs are unlinkable and this uses uh, old techniques from, from classical eCash that goes back to the, the 80s by David Chom. So what are the, the good things here is no one can steal the coins, no one knows the, the input-output relations, it works with Bitcoin, but again the problem is as with all these mixing services it really depends on who else mixes in the coins and how much volume there is so that whether your coins really get get mixed well okay um, so that was all I wanted to say about uh, things that works with work with Bitcoin now let's uh, let's talk about alternative currencies such as uh, Monero which uses a protocol called Cryptonaut. It was introduced in 2013 by Van Cyberhagen. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the goal of, of Cryptonaut is to hide who sent the payment and hide who received the payment. So to hide the spender, they use a concept called ring signatures, which I'll explain briefly. And to hide the receiver, they use stealth addresses, which was something that was even proposed before, but which is, is uh, implemented in Monero. And which uses a nice um, cryptographic trick called the diffie hellman key exchange that I'll explain, and this will be kind of the technical part of, of the presentation. Okay, so what are ring signatures? So in a, in a regular signature scheme, you have a signing key on the left and a verification key on the right, right? You, you use the signing key to create the signature of a document and then anyone who has the verification key can check the signature. Now in ring signatures is different because you sign a document with respect to a set of many keys. And the signature guarantees that you used one of the corresponding secret keys but it does not reveal which one of the keys was used. So you can sign on behalf of a set of, of public keys by using the guarantees you know one of the secret keys but you don't, the signature doesn't reveal which one of the secret keys you know. So if uh, in Bitcoin when you, when you make a transaction um, you use the secret key that corresponds to the address that, that you spent. So what you can do if you use ring signatures, what you do is say you want to spend um, this unspent transaction output. You just pick random other transaction outputs 
that are not spent in the blockchain. And then you make a ring signature that corresponds to all these public keys. Okay, so you, you create a new transaction, you make a ring signature that signs in the name of a lot of unspent outputs, including the one that you actually spent, because you need one of the secret keys. So say you have that one, but it does not reveal which one you actually spent. So you're not completely anonymous, but at least you've hidden in a set of um, in a set of other senders, or in other words, you've you've hidden which coin or unspent transaction outputs in a set of such outputs you actually spent. So this seems good, but it also seems bad because what about double spending, right? You don't know which one was spent, so. How can you prevent someone from spending it again? So what if later you do another transaction, you pick another set, and you again use your secret key to spend the same uh, output that you've already spent? So to prevent this, you actually use a, a variant of ring signatures, which is called a traceable ring signature. And uh, it guarantees that if you make a signature with one secret key, it does not reveal which secret key you used. But if you make two different signatures and you use the same key, then you can link them. So every time you see a new ring signature, you can compare it to all the signatures that are already there. And if it links to one of them, then you know there was a double spending. So again, we have the property that every in Bitcoin is kind of public. Everyone can check whether something was already spent because everything's written in the in the blockchain. But here it's these uh, traceable ring signatures that guarantee that you can only spend one transaction output once. And that's something that's uh, implemented in Monero. Any questions so far? Yeah? Do we have a slide uh, after? Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll uh, put them on the website. So no need to draw. <laughs> There's even videos. So. Um, <laughs> could you explain a little bit what is Monero? What kind of cryptocurrency it is? Uh, if it uh, uses uh, proof of work? Uh, it uses proof of work. I don't remember exactly which uh, hash algorithm it, works, it, it uses. But I would suppose a different one than Bitcoin because otherwise you could easily attack it. Um, and it, and it uses these, these two features, hiding senders, hiding receivers, and yeah. Okay, it uses a uh, Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what about hiding a receiver? So what does it even mean to hide a receiver? Because, I mean, in Bitcoin there's addresses, and these addresses you don't know who they belong to. But if WikiLeaks publishes one address which you can send donations to, then you see uh, all the transactions that went to that address, right? So if you want to avoid that, then what you could do in Bitcoin is you, you send the address to, if someone wants to send you a Bitcoin, you send this address privately so no one sees it, and you only use it once, so you cannot link several transactions that go to the same address. So that's something you can do, because it, of course it's very cumbersome, because you cannot just publish one address and everyone can send um, coins to you, which is what you would want to do if you're a website and you want donations. So that's something that can be solved with stealth addresses, where you publish one address and you can receive payments and no one knows that these payments went to you because they seem, uh, they seem unrelated to your address. And moreover, all these payments that you receive, they also seem unrelated to each other. So how is this done? So in a stealth address, you publish just one address. So say, here's your address, here's your secret key that goes with it. And if someone wants to send you money, then what they do is, they uh, create a new address that's somewhat related to your address, but looks completely different, so no one can see that they're related. And you also publish this um, trans, 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 transfer key, let's say. So these two things you publish. And what's the property of this transfer key? It is that if you know the key of the original address plus this transfer key, you can derive the secret key that goes with the new address. 
Okay, so once you've done that, it's easy. You just send your money to this new address and whoever owned the old address can derive a key for this new address and thus spend, spend these coins. And that's what's implemented by default in Monero. Um, okay, so if you want to know how this works, then we have to delve a little bit into some maths. In particular, um, a little bit of, of uh, what elliptic curves are and what the discrete logarithm problem is. But these are things that are used throughout uh, the talk and they're used ever, like, in a lot of places in all these new alt currencies. So, what is an elliptic curve? It's a curve that's, that has some, some form. So if you define the, these curves over the, over the reals, then they look like this. And this is the, sh the form of the equation is elliptic, hence the name, even if the curve doesn't look like an ellipsis. And the nice thing about um, these objects is that you can define an addition between points. So the curve consists of all the points that are on the curve. And now you can define an operation, like addition, that takes two points and defines a third point that's the sum of these two points. Okay? So if you define one uh, point on this curve to be your generator, then you can just add the generator with itself x times and we denote this like, like this. So in, if, if you compare with the regular numbers, then this generator will play the role of like the one, right? If, if you add one to itself, you can uh, reach every number you want. And if you have a generator in, in such a generator point on such a curve, then you can just add the generator with itself and reach every other curve point. So that's just notation. We say x times the generator is if we add it x times by itself. And now we can define the discrete logarithm problem which is the following. If you're given that generator and any other point on the curve, then since I said that by adding the generator to itself you can reach any other point, there must be some x such that x times g equals h. And the discrete logarithm problem is that if you're given g and h, then find this x such that the, this equation holds. Okay, so if this was just, if, if this was just numbers and g was 1, then uh, that's easy because like 5 equals 5 times 1, right? But uh, for elliptic curves this is actually hard and there's no efficient algorithms known for specific curves that we use which can solve this problem. And this is actually what's used in, in Bitcoin as well, namely in the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm where a secret key, public key pair is just of this form. So the secret key is some number and then the public key is this number times the generator. So it's a curve point and if you know it's discrete logarithm x then uh, that's, that's your secret key. Okay? So these, uh, this discrete, uh, the hardness of the discrete logarithm problem has, was actually the first has, has led to the first uh, crypto system that is public key cryptogra cryptographic in the sense that two people that have never shared any key amongst them can uh, communicate secretly with each other although everyone can listen to everything they say. And here's how it's done. So let's say we have Bob and Alice and they want to agree on a secret key. So once they have a secret key then they can use encryption and, and Bob can encrypt messages, Alice can decrypt them. But how do they agree on a key in public? And that's what you can use these, these, these uh, elliptic curves for. So you use such a group which is a point of, of on the curves and you have the generator G and what Bob does, he picks a random number X and he computes capital X which is X times the generator and sends it to Alice and Alice does the same, she picks a random Y computes capital Y which is small y times G and sends it to Bob and now what Bob can do is he computes Z 
which is x, which he picked, times the y that he got from Alice. And if you look what this is, so capital Y is small y times g, so that equals x times y times g. And if you look what Alice can do, if she uh, takes her secret uh, number that she picked and multiplies it with what she received from Bob, then she gets the same thing. Okay? So we saw that, note that if you want to compute this, you, ne you need to know either x or y, the small ones, the secret values. So if you're somewhere in the middle and you're only watching this, you only saw the capital letters, and from these you cannot derive z. But every one of them can derive this shared key by using this protocol. And that's actually exactly what's used for the stealth addresses. So now we can look how uh, they work. So in Bitcoin, as I said, you have a public key, which is a curve point, which is secret key times the generator. Actually, in Bitcoin, you talk of addresses, which is just the hash of this point. But let's just stay with the points. If you want to send money to this point, then you sign a transaction that has uh, this address as output, this P. And if you know the secret key X, then you can again sign a transaction, you can spend this coin, right? So what does it mean to own a coin in Bitcoin? It means that you know the secret key that goes with some public key that's uh, in the blockchain. So in stealth addresses, it's a little bit trickier, but not much. So now we just have, instead of having just one public key, we have a pair of public keys. So we have capital A, capital B, and the secret key is just the discrete logarithms of the two. Okay, so whoever wants to receive anonymous payments can publish this address. And now if someone wants to send you money, what he does is he creates this related address, as I explained before, but now we see how they actually do it. And it's basically the same that Alice did in the, in the key exchange protocol. So she picks a random Y, she creates this uh, transfer key uh, capital Y, which is Y times G, and then she creates this new address, she hashes small y uh, times a, a from the receiver's public key, why does she hash it? Because this is a group element and here we need a number, right? So it's just to make the group element a number, that's why we hash it, times the generator plus b. So now if whoever received this payment wants to, say, wants to spend it, you need to know the secret key that goes with uh, this p. But the nice observation is that, so Alice has created y times a, but let's say this is Bob, knows capital Y and small a. So since Y times A equals small y small a times G, and that's the same as small a times capital Y, like we saw it before. So this is actually a value that you can compute, that Bob can compute. And if you look at what the discrete logarithm of this is, so what the secret key would be that corresponds to P, then uh, we can write it as this. So this would be the x that goes with that p and that allows spending of that coin. And that's precisely something that you can compute if you know the secret key of the original address plus this transfer key, which is capital Y. So if you're wondering what this b is for, it's basically if we didn't have that b, then the sender would also know the secret key, right? just as an aside. And we want on the receiver to be the only one who knows the secret key and spend the coin. Okay, so since we've already started with crypto, let's do a little bit more crypto so that I can, only, can also explain how confidential transactions work. So, confidential transactions, I told you, is a protocol that allows sending um, coins or transactions without revealing the value of these transactions. And what it uses is a cryptographic concept called a commitment, which is the digital equivalent of an envelope. So an envelope in the sense of there's a commit phase where you can put a message in the envelope and later you can open it. Okay, and we want two properties of this. 
Uh, if you show this envelope to Bob and it's closed, then Bob doesn't know what's inside. This is what we call hiding. So the commitment, which is the envelope, hides the message that's inside. And the other thing is called binding, which is that if you open it later, you cannot change your mind. You cannot take something out that you didn't put in before. So there's no way of uh, opening this commitment to two different values. So once you've put in some message, you can only take that one message out. And these are the two properties we need. And uh, the last uh, mathy slide is how do we instantiate this? Uh, we use elliptic curves again. So say we have two points on elliptic curve G and H. Then we define a commitment to a message M as this. So we take this point H multiplied by the message M, which we suppose is a number, plus some random number that we picked times um, the second curve point G. So can you see why this hides the message? So intuitively, if, if this is a random number, then this is a random point. And if you take something and you add a random point, then the whole thing is random. So you can show that, show that C is just a complete random point that is, that is uh, independent of the message. So if you only know C, then you don't know which message is in, because all you see is a random point. Okay? But however, you can open this commitment, and if you open it, you reveal the message that was inside, and you also uh, give out this, this random value R. Okay, last very mathy thing is for those who are interested. So I said hiding because for any message you can just solve this equation here. There exists a randomness that would explain that this message was committed, so it's perfectly hiding. And binding, we said that there's no way you can open a commitment to two different messages. So say if Alice created um, a message randomness pair and then a different pair, for, uh, uh, an opening for a different message and if both of them open the same commitment then we would have m times h plus r times g equals c but also m prime times h plus r prime times g equals also c, right? That would mean that this c is open in two different ways but if you just um, reorganize this equation then you see that r prime minus r divided by m minus m prime, note that m and m prime are different, times g equals h. So what Alice would have to do, or what he, she implicitly did, when she showed two different openings of the same commitment, she, res she solved the discrete logarithm problem. And if we assume this is hard, then she cannot do that. Okay, that was quite a bit of prick crypto, provable security, <laughs> everything there. For commit, yeah, you can also do a, a use a hash function. The thing is, so there's another way of doing a commitment, which is you take uh, the message you want to commit, you just add some randomness, and then you hash it. And then if the hash function is what's called collision resistance, which is a standard property of hash functions, you can also not open it in two different ways. The reason why I showed this commitment is because it has an additional property, and that's the property that we need for confidential transactions, which is that it's homomorphic. Okay, so let's breathe for a little bit after all this math. Maybe leave the slide if someone wants to. So here's how confidential transactions work. So the goal of confidential transactions is you want to hide the amount of a payment. Um, and what we use for it is exactly these Pedersen commitments, which um, are defined in this way. So we have a value that we commit to multiplied by h plus r times g. So the property, as I uh, just said, that's very nice about Pedersen commitments is that they're homomorphic. What does that mean? It means that if you add two commitments, 
So if the sum, then you get a commitment to the sum of the committed values. So you can basically, without knowing what's committed, you can create a related commitment uh, by just adding them. And it's not too hard to see if you have two commitments, C1, C2, C1 commits to V1 with randomness R1, C2 commits to V2 with randomness R2. If you just add these two things, you can rewrite it as this equation. And you see that this is a commitment to the sum of the values with randomness, the sum of the randomnesses. So for example, if we have a commitment to 1 using randomness 5, we add a commitment to 1 using randomness 10, we subtract the commitment, we can also subtract, not only add, forgot to tell you that, of 2 with randomness 15, then we get a commitment to, so if we just um, write it out, we have 1 plus 1 minus 2 is 0, and the randomness 5 plus 10 minus 15 is also 0. So we actually get uh, zero in the end, the group element that occurred uh, of this, the elliptic curve point that represents zero. So without showing what values I are in, in these commitments, I still told you something about them. Namely, I told you that if I add the first value to the second value and subtract the third value, then that's zero. And that's the property that we will use for confidential transactions. Why is this important? Because if we just have a, a transaction and instead of writing how much um, value goes in and how much goes out, if we just use commitments instead, then we have a problem because we need to make sure for the whole system to work that every transaction only creates the value that it destroyed before, right? In the transactions you have to make sure that uh, whatever goes in is not less than what goes out. So in Bitcoin everything is in the clear, you can just check that. Every transaction you can verify not much, not more goes out than went in. But if everything's committed and I said these commitments don't reveal anything, then it's hard to check. So uh, someone could just generate money and the system would not work. But with what I just showed you, if I arrange the randomness of the uh, ingoing commitments and outgoing commitments in a way that they cancel out, then, uh, and the values also cancel out, meaning the sum of all the ingoing values minus the sum of the outgoing values is also zero, because as, as much goes out then goes in, then I can just check whether if I add all the commitments on the left side, subtract the ones on the right side, if that is zero, then I'm convinced that no money was created. Because I've subtracted the values that go out from those that go in and the difference was zero. So this seems very nice and it seems to work, but there's uh, one annoying thing, which is that it also works like this. So I take commitments to, say I have a commitment to two bitcoins, one bitcoin, one bitcoin, so four bitcoins go in, what goes out? 4, because minus 5 plus 9 is also 4. So if I could do a transaction like that, then I would just throw away this, because I don't want to spend negative amount of coins. And I have now a coin that's worth 9 bitcoins, so I've created money, right? Because all this um, equation tells me is that this minus that is 0, and that's the case, even for negative values, so you don't want that. So what we actually have to do is um, add a thing called a range proof, which is another neat cryptographic trick that uh, convinces you that whatever is con committed inside such a commitment is a value between 0 and 2 to the 64, so something positive. Questions? And it's about the range of proof. So the range proof is we have an expert in the back, maybe <laughs> no, because I was working on this with a student. Um, so the the trick is that basically, if we have, and this is something that I'll I'll show you in a minute, if you have. Um, 
a commitment to zero, okay, then it has a special form because this thing is zero, so it's only R times G. So a commitment to zero I can view like a public key and R would be the secret key, right? So that's, if I have a commitment to zero, I know the secret key that goes with it if I interpret it as a public key. So I can convince you that I have a commitment to zero by just using that secret key to sign a message. Because I can only sign a message for a public key if I know the secret key. I only know the secret key of a commitment if it's a commitment to zero. So what I then do is that I basically decompose the number in all its bits and then I, I show that everything's a bit by using a ring signature where either I know the key that corresponds to commitment to zero or a commitment to one and that, that's how I convince you that I only use bits and, and that's basically a range proof. So a range proof is like a, a ring signature using as the keys in whose name I sign uh, these bit commitments. Okay, now um, Mimble Wimble. So why, uh, so this guy seems to be a character from Harry Potter, but uh, not my generation. So apparently the guy, so as with Bitcoin, it's uh, very en vogue to use pseudonyms when you invent cool stuff. So, so Satoshi Nakamoto is a pseudonym. The person that invented Mimble Wimble used as a pseudonym the uh, name of this character in the French version of Harry Potter. But I don't know if it's someone in this room that invented it or if it's a red herring. Actually, I think it's a red herring because if you read the document, then there's a voila in there and there's an accent de queue instead of an accent graph. And I think a French person wouldn't have made the mistake. But maybe that's another red herring, I don't know. So it's just speculation of who invented this. But, um, what Mimble Wimble does is, I'll explain Mimble Wimble and then we'll have a break. It's taking this concept of uh, confidential transactions and making a lot of cool stuff on top of it. So the drawbacks of the approaches that I mentioned is that confidential transactions, precisely because of these range proofs, they're very big. Because as I told you, you kind of decompose the amount bit by bit and then for every bit you have uh, these signature elements so it's a lot of group elements. So the size of a confide one um, confidential transaction is about two kilobytes. So if, if Bitcoin had used confidential transactions from start then the blockchain would be more than a terabyte now. Um, the other thing is that, but it seems to be something that you can't really avoid if you want confidential amounts then uh, that's maybe the price you have to pay. But the other thing is that these ring signatures, I told you, you take a set of unspent transactions and then you spend one of them, but you don't tell which one you spent. So in Bitcoin you can tell exactly which transaction outputs have been spent. So you can kind of create a condensed view of the blockchain where you only remember the ones that are not spent. But if you use ring signatures you can't do them because unspent transactions look like spent transactions. So you need to keep all the history forever. There's no way of pruning. And that's actually what Mimblewimble allows you to do. So it uses confidential transactions and it uses a concept uh, introduced by Maxwell earlier already. So there was this idea of cut through. Can I somehow prune the blockchain and get rid of everything that has already been spent? Because there's kind of no way of, no reason why I should um, remember things that have already been spent. Um, and moreover, this also blurs the transaction graph. The uh, negative thing with uh, Mimblewimble is that it does not allow you to do any scripts, so you can't do um, time lock transactions, um, contingent payments, lightning, all these things that you can do with, with uh, Bitcoin. You cannot, with the uh, the initial proposed system, you can't do it. Okay, so as I said, the starting point for Mimblewimble is this confidential transaction. So we have a transaction, in go um, commitments of the inputs, outcome commitments of the outputs, 
a commitment is of the form value times this curve point plus randomness times another curve point and this range proof pi, which I'll ignore for now. And you can check that the transaction is okay, nothing was created, because you can just, this should be the sum of all the inputs, you subtract the sum of the outputs and you get zero. So the first idea for Mimblewimble is that this thing, so you cannot take, if you don't know the randomness that corresponds to these uh, commitments, you cannot create outputs that such that this equation is satisfied, because you also need the randomnesses to cancel out. So the idea in Mimblewimble is that you use, um, the coin is basically just the commitment, and if you want to spend it, you need to know this randomness or the opening of the coin, and that's your secret key. Okay? The problem is that, say these coins belong to Alice and she sends them to Bob. Okay? So this belongs to Bob. Then, um, in order for this to hold, the randomness on the left side needs to be the same as the randomness on the right side. Right? So if Alice, if, if we say that the randomness is the secret key, Alice spends coins to Bob's, to Bob, then Alice still knows that the sum of the randomness. So we have a property that we don't want, namely that this, once you spend the coin, then you should not be able to spend whatever came out of that. So what Mimblewimble does is it realizes that it need not be the case that um, the input minus the output gives exactly zero, meaning that the values cancel out and the randomness, but all you want is that the values cancel out. Because if the values cancel out, you know that everything that came out already also went in before. Okay, I said that. So the idea is that if you do this um, difference between input and outputs, what you want is that it's of the form zero, because this is the, uh, the values that you cancel out, plus some uh, x, which is this randomness minus that randomness. Um, which now you can arrange in a way that only the receiver knows it. So basically, what if you if you um, create the transaction, you tell your randomness to the receiver. The receiver creates his randomness. He knows all the randomness, so he knows this value x. So what you do now is that this is what I just uh, said before: is if you want to convince someone that um, this thing here is of that form, then you just pretend that x times g is a public key. And um, if you make a signature using the secret key x, then you convince, at least you convince me, that uh, you know this x. And if you know the x, then it means that this commitment is actually a commitment to zero. Okay, yes? Uh, okay. <laughs> So, um, so the, 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 the important thing about these commitments is that if you sum commitments, then you actually sum the values and the randomness, right? So if you take the sum of the inputs and the, minus the sum of the outputs, and if the values cancel out, and also the randomness cancels out, then you just have, uh, so here you have all the values of the left side minus the values of the right side, you would have zero. And if you also arrange the randomness in this way, you would have zero there as well. So the whole thing, this difference here would be zero. That's what confidential transaction did. The problem was that if you do that, then whoever knows the randomness on this side also knows it on the other side because it's the same, right? That's why they cancel out. So then if we want the receiver if we want to allow the receiver to choose the randomness independently of the one of the sender, then it must be different. So we would not have that, uh, the, the values would still cancel out if everything's okay, right? Because everything that comes out also went in. But since we cannot tweak the randomness such so that they also cancel out, because then the sender would know what it is, we still have this um, x times g that's left. Okay, so if I want to convince you that this minus this is a commitment to zero, 
Now this is basically the, if I want to show you, this is a commitment to zero and it's of the form x times g and there's no value here. So if this was um, 2 times h plus x times g, I would not know, and I, I interpret this the thing in the circle as a public key, I would not know the secret key that goes with it. Because the secret key that goes with it is whatever you have to multiply to g to arrive at that value. So if I can convince you that I know the value x such that x times g equals the whole thing, then this means the whole thing is a commitment to zero because there's no, there's no part h here. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this was the first step. The first step was basically allowing this value to act as a secret key by finding a, a way to still check that no money was created in this transaction but allowing the randomness on the, on the output side to be independent of that from the input side and thereby letting the receiver choose that randomness. So you, in the transaction you add this access value, they call access value x times g and you make a signature that's valid under this, under this uh, public key and that convinces uh, people that if you then compute this thing that in minus out really equals that value that the difference was a commitment to zero. Okay, so now that's not all the magic there is. Now comes the real magic. So if we have two transactions then in order, so the only thing that there's no signatures, this, this is the only signature there is. It's not as before that there's an address for every uh, thing that goes in and everyone has to sign it. No, there's just commitments. And to, to um, show that you really spent these coins, it's because there is this signature. Because if you didn't know all the openings of the commitments, you wouldn't be able to make this signature. So this one single signature acts as a confirmation for the whole transaction. Okay, and you check it by just taking the, the difference of inputs and outputs and checking whether it's this value x1g and whether the signature is valid. Okay, so if you have two transactions, so inputs, inputs, outputs, uh, second transaction is valid as well, what you can do now is you can just sum these two equations, okay, so now you have, would have in here would be the sum of all the inputs, out would be the sum of all the outputs, and if you, if you look at uh, the equation on the right hand side you would have the sum of these uh, special excess values. Okay, so what you could do is you can glue transactions together and you can still verify that everything was correct. You don't know which, one, which input went in where, which output came out where. You only have a set of inputs, a set of outputs and this equation allows you to check that no money was created. Assuming that these signatures are valid. Okay, so the next step is suppose this transaction was in some block and this transaction in a, a block later. So what typically happens is that something that's an output before becomes an input later, right? If that, trans if that money is spent. So we would have the case that say this blue output here is the blue input here. And I mean, these things are commitments, they're just curve points. So you have the same curve point there. And if you look at this equation again, then you see in is the sum of all the inputs, out is the sum of all the outputs. So if you take out this value here and there, the equation is still valid. So what you can do is, you can just erase the transaction as if it never happened and everything is still valid. Because if you erase the transaction, that's fine because it's been spent anyway. And you can still check that no money was created. And you still have the insurance that every um, coin, which is a commitment, can only be spent if you know the secret key that goes with it. So that's called cut through because you basically eliminate any information you don't need anymore. So if you do this with all transactions that ever happened, you just 
uh, collect all the inputs, you collect all the outputs, you collect all these proofs that no money was created. Then basically all outputs that have not been spent are input somewhere that have been spent are input somewhere else, so that will cancel out, you can erase them. All the outputs that will be left are the ones that, not, that haven't been spent yet. All the inputs that are left are coin-based transactions, so like inputs that are not outputs of somewhere, but where money was created. So basically all you need to remember is the essential information. Where money was created, what money still is there, and uh, the proofs that no money was created out of thin air. And that's all the information you need for Mimblewimble. Of course, to make this whole thing into a blockchain and then um, decide if you can drop block, uh, blocks in the blockchain and how, and how you deal with all these things is uh, another technical challenge and, and Poelstra has a, a paper on that. So that was Mimble Wimble. Maybe just to motivate that uh, the talk will continue after the break. So the drawbacks is there's no scripting because basically this very special form of how transactions are uh, defined doesn't allow any scripting and it's interactive because you cannot just pay someone publicly by signing a transaction like in Bitcoin but you need to somehow con communicate the randomness which is the secret key of your coin so that the, uh, the other party can create these uh, access values and signatures. No more math, just pictures. So I'll talk about zero knowledge, zero coin, zero cash, zcash. So what's a zero knowledge proof? It's a concept that was invented by Goldwasser, Mikali and Rakov in 85 and it's, um, it's about convincing someone that something is true without revealing anything else. And uh, I guess it's very hard to grasp the concept so it's best done by an example. So suppose that there's a Sudoku and uh, I want to convince you that I know a solution of the Sudoku without telling you the solution. So here's a protocol how we can do that and I'll then convince you that I didn't reveal anything. But still you're convinced that I know a solution. So there's a verifier and a prover. Say so you're the verifier and the prover. We have um, playing cards numbered from 1 to 9 and what the verifier does is on every um, so all the numbers that are already there that are part of the, the Sudoku I put a card with 5 but upside down here, a card with 3 upside down there so I cover every entry that's already there that's, that's what you do as a verifier with a card, okay? upside down so now what I will do is I know a solution, so I also know all the numbers that should go there, so I'll do the same. Again, I put cards upside down that correspond <coughs> to the solution. So in the end, it looks like this. I'm the prover, I've covered everything. So are you convinced that I know a solution? I guess not yet. But the nice thing is there's um, one property that a solution has to satisfy. And it is that, in case you're not familiar with Sudoku, every line has to have every number exactly once, every uh, colon has to have every number exactly once, and every 3 by 3 square as well. Okay, then if, if that's the case, then that's a solution. So, what you can do is, you can challenge me and say, well, if it's a solution, then I want to see that in this line every number appears exactly once. So I will not just turn around the cards because then you see a part of the solution and my goal is to not reveal anything. So what I'll do is, and you can watch me doing this, I will take all the cards upside down, mix them and then give them to you. So you can um, oops, you can check that every number from 1 to 9 is contained. Okay, so of course I could have not known a solution, I've been lucky that this line is consistent, right? But you could just, we could just play this thing again and again and again. And if 
in a hundred trials I convince you every time, then I hope you're convinced that I really know a solution, right? Because if I didn't know a solution, then one line, one column or one square would be inconsistent and there's some probability that you catch me. Okay, so you as a verifier, when we do this protocol, you're convinced. But suppose that you just watch two people, where there's a prover and a verifier, and they execute this. And you can watch everything. Would you be convinced that the verifier knows a solution? You wouldn't, because if, um, if the prover already knew that the verifier will, say, will ask for this line, then I could just put the cards, um, the missing cards there. Everything else could be inconsistent, but that line is correct, and that's easy to do, right? So if I know where I'll be challenged, then I can convince you. So if you just see two people, you don't know if the prover had already told the verifier before which lines or boxes or columns he will ask. And so to you, it's not convincing, right? In the, when, when you actually played the thing, then you could pick where I should open. So that convinced you. But if you just see two people, then even if they don't know the solution, they could still pretend that they know the solution and for you it will look exactly the same. And that's, what's, and that's how you actually form, formalize the concept of without revealing anything. You formalize it by saying that there exists uh, a protocol or a simulator that can um, run this protocol between the proof and the verifier and you as an outsider can't tell the difference whether this is just simulated or whether this is actually a true run of the protocol. Okay, so that's a nice example of zero knowledge proofs. But you can actually show that using um, more, more cryptography, you could actually for basically any statement you can imagine, you can make uh, such a protocol. So, this has been um, refined to uh, ZK SNARKs and that's the main ingredient of these uh, fancy cryptocurrencies like uh, Zcash. And what it stands for is a zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. So we saw what zero knowledge means. It means the proof doesn't reveal anything. We saw uh, what an argument of knowledge is, so I can convince someone that I know something, like a, a Sudoku solution. So let's look at uh, what's left. So what does it mean to be non-interactive? It means that the prover just sends one message to the verifier, the proof, and then the verifier says convinced or not convinced. So we saw in the, in the Sudoku protocol there was a lot of interaction. And we saw that actually um, it see the interaction seemed kind of important, which I'll come to in a bit. The uh, succinct part is that this proof, no matter what statement you prove, no matter how big the uh, solution that you um, claim to know is, the proof will always be constant size. And in particular for the SNARK implementation, it's just eight uh, elliptic curve points. Okay, so let's go back to this non-interactivity where there seems to be a problem, right? Because before we saw that uh, I can convince someone if that person is playing with me this Sudoku game. Because it's that person that tells me where to open, that challenges me. But if there's no interaction, then how should the simulator simulate that proof, right? If there's just the proof that can be simulated, then why would the verifier be convinced? Before the verifier was convinced because he was participating in this interaction and not just watching. So to get around this and to still uh, make a, a meaningful uh, notion, um, what non-interactive um, proofs or argument introduced is uh, trusted parameters. So the prover and the verifier, they both have access to some trusted parameters and um, the verifier will check or will decide whether he's convinced based on what the prover sends and what these trusted parameters are. And for the SNARKs that, um, that Zcash uses, the parameters look something like this. x times g, x squared times g, and so on. 
And now the simulation, that before the simulation was I can just pretend to interact if I'm not actually interacting with the verifier, now the simulation becomes differently, different, namely um, you can show that if you know the secret value x, so it looks a bit like a public key secret key pair, if you know the secret key then you can actually simulate proofs. Then you can create proofs that will convince the verifier, although you prove a wrong statement, although you don't know what you pretend to prove knowledge of. And this is um, precisely this uh, toxic setup that uh, Zcash has. It has there, are, there are these trusted parameters and um, if you are the one to have set them up, so if you know this value then you can actually um, simulate proofs, proof wrong things. Okay, so in um, zero cache, if we assume we have trusted parameters and we trust them, then the way it works is kind of similar to, well, it also uses commitments like, uh, like confidential transactions and Mimbo Wimbo. And now a coin is a commitment to its value and other things, but also a serial number. So every coin has a unique serial number and it's a commitment. So all you see is commitment, so again, you don't know what the value is, you don't know which coin belongs to whom. And if you, if you create a transaction, you make new coins, and of all the coins that you spend, you reveal the serial number. Okay? And why do you do that? That's to prevent double spending. Because if you later spend the same, you don't know, uh, you basically you spend a coin without telling which one you spent, but you still reveal its serial number, so if later you spend the coin again, you'll, you'll see that that serial number had already been spent. So that's how you prevent double spending. Moreover, you have to, of course, prove that the serial number that you revealed con um, uh, corresponds to one of the coins that are in the system, that the value you transfer to new coins is not more than the old, old coins were worth and all other things. So basically, you prove that you've done everything correctly, and that's what you can do using these uh, ZK snarks. So, this is fully anonymous. If you believe uh, commitments are, um, are hiding, so the commitments don't reveal anything, the snarks don't reveal anything either, so everything's completely anonymous. The drawbacks are that uh, it's slow, so snarks now creation is slow. It's to, to create the transaction, it takes about two minutes on a, on a PC. And you have this problem with the trusted parameters. And uh, the Zcash people, they admit that. So if you know uh, the secret that was used to create them, then you can actually counterfeit coins. But the question I asked was, what about anonymity? What if you don't trust the parameters, can you at least still be sure that your payments are anonymous? We saw that you cannot be sure that someone, that no one counterfeited coins because that's uh, what, that's how snarks are. But I, I showed that if you tweak the snarks a little bit, basically doesn't cost you much at all, then you can show that even if the snarks parameters were set up in a malicious way, anonymity or zero knowledge is still guaranteed. And uh, with that good news I conclude and maybe just uh, in case someone might wonder why in these Pedersen commitments we also had these uh, elements G and H and we said that if you can break the commitment, the binding thing, then you can solve a discrete log. Actually you can show that if you know the discrete logs of these two then you can break binding, so it seems to be similar to snarks. But what you actually do is you use nothing up my sleeve curve points, where you basically, that's like the technical part, you hash into the group and then you don't know the discrete logarithm of it. So that's what's done for uh, um, confidential transactions. The problem is that the difference with snarks is that these parameters, they have structure. So I cannot just use random curve points for which I don't know the logarithm. But as you can see, I have x times g, but then I have x squared times g. And there's no way of, um, no known way of creating snark parameters that are correctly computed without knowing the secret. 
just to terminate on a technical note. Thank you. There's uh, apparently some developments where, so I haven't really looked at it in any detail, but um, so what they suggest is some reduced form of scripts where, for example, if you want to spend a transaction, you have to know a hash pre-image. So with that, you could do time lock and um, contingent payment. So the, the idea is just that, so what, in the original proposal, what you do uh, with this signature, so the signature was there to prove that you know this value x2, but you could actually sign something particular. And by signing, for example, a hash value and requiring that um, when you spend the output, you need to know the pre-image, then you could do like uh, limited versions of script. There's also, there's also another idea which was um, that you could do, so a nice feature of Bitcoin is this multi-signature um, property where you need, well, several persons have to sign the same transaction until, until it um, is valid. And here there's also some idea of using like a, a multi-signer signature instead of there. But uh, yeah, don't know where the development is for that. But there are some ideas. But of course, it's yeah. If in Bitcoin you can, you could basically. I mean, you have a lot more power because you define what it means to redeem a coin. What has to be satisfied, which usually is just there should be a signature that that goes with the address. But here, uh, yeah, it's it's very different. To allow these cut through combinations, you lose this property. Can we come back uh, to the zero cash uh, protocol and the zero knowledge uh, proof? Uh, this. Can you just explain again the, the zero knowledge proof uh, snark? <laughs> The easy part. So for for example, a snark allows you to. Okay, so let's 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 concentrate on a, a part of the statement that you prove. So in um, in Zcash, all coins are commitments. Okay, so they're commitments to zero numbers, which you don't know, and then the. Um, all the coins are also uh, hashed in a Merkle tree, so you have like a, a root commitment to all the coins. And then the statement that you prove is that um, I know a serial number such that there is an opening of the Merkle tree that goes to a coin such that this is the commitment of that serial number. Mm -hmm. And these are, so basically what the snark, so how it's defined is, all these statements you have to represent in an, uh, as an arithmetic circuit. Mm -hmm. Then you convert it into something that's called a, a quadratic arithmetic program and then you do some other magic and uh, then you use pairings to verify them. But uh, so for example how they implemented all this, so they, the commitments that they use are um, SHA-256 hashes. So the, the kind of commitments that you described. Why? Because they can be uh, easier like represented in an easier way as a circuit and, and you have to like work with the, the circuits and not the beautiful algebra behind it if you want to use these snarks. So you prove knowledge of, an, of, an, of a path and an opening for the serial number and also the, the, val like the values, they're also committed in there and so you prove that you create the new coins you created don't have more value than the ones you spent and that you've 
release the serial number correctly. What about the ethical associated with the uh, which which curve they use? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> so it's not an exotic one. Uh. It's it, I mean the the thing that they need is pairing, so they they have to use a a curve which allows this bilinear map, because the basically how the snark is verified is you take uh, elements, so group elements from the parameters. And you take the elements of the proofs, and then you you check that some pairings and work. Again, Zcash uses a proof of work. Zcash pr uses proof of work. Yeah, I think the. I guess uh, what doesn't use. I mean, I guess there's more qualified people in here. What does not use proof of work is uh, peer coin. Peercoin is the biggest proof of stake based one, I think. And then you have Burstcoin, which uses a kind of proof of space, but in a very bad way. And then you have proposals like Space Mint, <laughs> which I could also talk about, which uses proof of space. And but coins are not uh, pre mined. Uh, okay, so in, in Bitcoin, so you, you mentioned this pre-mining problem, right? In Bitcoin, what Nakamoto did is in his Genesis block, he put the hash of the London Times, I think, headline or something. So you knew that he couldn't have created that block before that date that he claimed it was created. So he knew that he only started mining there. In, uh, so you know that there's no, he's not already knew like a long chain that then he could use to overtake and do double spendings. Uh, in zero cash, the question is kind of moot, right? Because if if you don't trust them, if you don't trust their trusted parameters, then they can just create coins without even like doing attacks based on on pre mining or or mining. I mean, yeah, maybe you could trust that their multi-party protocol to set up the parameters was correct, but they still did pre mining, but. I don't know if they put like some timestamp in their Genesis book. But I don't know. So Zcash is more sophisticated than uh, Monero. Yes, by orders of magnitude, I'd say. Also, Mon Monero is basically. Um, all the cryptography you use for Monero, I think you, yeah, you don't need pairings, you just need elliptic curves and everything is discrete log based. So like proof wise you believe in a random oracle model and you believe that discrete log is hard and or maybe C, CDH or so then, then that's fine. For, uh, for Zcash the, the crypto is a lot more sophisticated. So you have a lot more machinery, you have stronger assumptions that you have to make, so hardness assumptions, not only it's hard to compute the discrete log, but it's uh, other things which are, which you can show are, are um, easier to do than discrete log, still have to be hard and there's more, more crypto involved. But I think the, the, the really nice thing about Zcash is that these snarks, they were invented, I mean, like these probabilistically checkable proofs that were the, the, the foundation of the first snarks, they're like uh, asymptotically they're beautiful and they're very short, but if you want to implement them, then you need a trillion years to compute. And then, uh, then there was progress in cryptography, making these snarks more efficient using a different approach, which were, were these uh, quadratic ar arithmetic uh, programs using pairings to verify them. And still it seemed like completely, uh, so you, you have like your statement that you want to show is, is like a circuit and then for every, your public parameters for every wire in this uh, complicated circuit you had a group element and it seemed like uh, out of uh, reach for anything practical. So I think it's quite uh, an achievement uh, what these Zcash people did is how they, how they improved things to, to make this actually work. I mean, as I said, it still takes two minutes to create the snack, but compared to a trillion years, it's already good. 
And concerning Tumblebee, the, the only drawbacks you mentioned are, are the volumes. Yeah. I mean, of course, you have to, like, historically it came after Zcash. But uh, yeah, does it solve all the problems? Yeah, it's the volumes problem. You still, I mean, you need some central, basically if you want to be completely anonymous and be hidden, your anonymity set should be everything. You should just, if you spend a coin, you shouldn't know anything except that it's some unspent output that you spend. But in order to do that, that every transaction would have to go through one tumbler. So that's not, not doable either. So it's a, uh, it's like something you add on top of Bitcoin. It's, it has these nice features that you don't need to trust it at all. But of course it's different from having uh, a system like Zcash where it's just from scratch everything is anonymous. But it's, yeah, the, tum the tumble bit, the, the tricks are neat, like how they use uh, John blind signatures to, to not link these things and still use these uh, escrow payments that we see in Lightning to, to make sure no one can steal anything is nicely done. No, I didn't see that. Is the next version of Ethereum Metropolis? Okay, so so what? So you can do anonymous payments with it, or you can use Snarks to verify computation. No statements. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, I have to look into it. But yeah, it's things are happening so fast. <laughs> it's hard to catch up, keep up. If you, if you look at the history of SNARKs, then what, what they were proposed for was exactly this, that if you want to outsource computation, you give uh, your computation to the cloud, the cloud gives you the answer, how do you know the cloud computed it correctly, it also gives you a SNARK that everything was done correctly. So yeah, you could, you could just have on the blockchain, you have the verification of, of the correctness, but the computation you do outside. So also, yeah, so like, um, these um, uh, contingent payments that Maxwell, I think, proposed, they also use SNARKs. So what you could do is you, you make a Bitcoin transaction, um, where, which is uh, related to a Sudoku puzzle, and anyone who knows a solution to it can, uh, can redeem the transaction. And that's basically you, you... So what you do is you encrypt the secret key and uh, I don't remember but you also you use you use snarks that to to verify Yeah. You said on Uber Uber we can uh, hide the, the, the amount yeah. and the transacting parties, what? Yes. Uh, and is there proof that the transaction has ever existed or not? Um, you mean a, a spent transaction? No, not the spent transaction. Not the unspent. Uh, so the unspent ones, they're still there, but... Ah, okay. So... Proof that... Uh, um, I think it, uh, Michele, correct me if I'm wrong, but it really depends on whether your transaction is in a, in a, the thing is that they're all broadcast at some point, 
and then later you can do this cut through so you can uh, eliminate things once they're spent so if you just monitor the network then you will and you store everything you will know every transaction right so it's just uh, a way of for example if you in Bitcoin if you join as a miner you want to convince be convinced that the system is is uh, consistent what you have to do is you have to start from Genesis block and and verify everything in Mimblewimble what you have to do is you have just have to someone gives you this uh, compact representation which only uh, contains everything that hasn't been spent and everything where coins were created and that's enough to to check whether uh, whether it's consistent so if we join uh, the network we do not know that there have been a transaction before yeah exactly you wouldn't no. the other thing is of course you have to um, you also have to protect against so if, if you you have to verify a little bit into the past because otherwise someone could just um, do um, like a basically yeah you have to you have to make sure that whatever you see is the result of a lot of proof of works that went into it right so that you're sure that someone didn't just give you something that's not the actual blockchain of course it's consistent in itself but is it also the the result of uh, of the history of Mimblewimble and are all the proofs of work there and and there's like these things that Poelstra did is is that he showed that if you look at blocks then there's some blocks that have really good proofs of work and others that are not so good and these ones you can drop and so it would still be hard to overtake it because you keep a, a lot of good blocks but what was your initial question? <laughs> <laughs> I went off on a tangent I didn't get the last part but you answered my questions <laughs> okay, George, thank you very much for this uh, thanks for coming talk.